Welcome to Dietetics After Dark, your source for food-related crime, scandal, and fraud. Hi, everyone. I'm Becca. And I'm Sarah. And I'm feeling slow as molasses this morning. (laughs) You took my line. (laughs) Oh, did I? (laughs) So one of us had to say it, because not only is it 7 a.m., but our story is molasses. It's slow as molasses. It's actually a very rapidly paced story. Yeah. <laughs> but no, I feel like this is a really sticky situation that we're covering today. <laughs> so you're going to talk a little bit about the history of molasses. And then I'm going to dive into a story that really shook the Boston area in the early 1900s, killed 21 people, and it completely contradicted that saying. Which the whole saying, I must say, is actually as slow as molasses in January. And if I'm not mistaken, the molassacre took place in January. Yes. Is that where it originated from? No. I actually did a little deep dive into it, and it originated, I think it was in the 1800s. I think it was 18, like wow. 40 or something like that. <laughs> mm-hmm. <laughs> that I bet so many headlines <laughs> at the time just couldn't resist <laughs> using that. Such a good play on yeah, words. Totally. <laughs> well, we had an exciting week. That we did. Mm -hmm. Really exciting. We made it into two publications, which is really exciting for us. And one of which was a Road Trip Essentials podcast list for this magazine called Free From. And it got us thinking, if you're listening to Dietetics After Dark on your road trip, can you please tag us in some pictures? We'd like to see. Yeah, let us know. Since we're not going anywhere. (laughs) Not yet, anyways. Yeah, all the Americans that are road tripping, please tag us so we can live vicariously through you. And we also, for a brief moment in time, a brief but exciting moment, reached number seven on the nutrition charts in Canada. For one day. For one day. It was a really good day. I'll remember (laughs) that day forever. (laughs) (laughs) All right. Should we dive right in? You know what? I actually, sorry. One one sec. I forgot to do something. We have to give a shout out to our listener who recommended this story. Because this is one that I'd never heard of before. So this came from our listener, Genevieve Baru. Mm -hmm. And I just wanted to quickly thank her for this amazing suggestion because I had not heard of the Malasker before I started doing this research. Thank you, Genevieve. I'm so excited to learn more. Yes, thank you. The information in this podcast is for entertainment purposes only. If you're interested in medical nutrition therapy or personalized nutrition advice, please talk to a registered dietitian in your area. All the citations and relevant links for anything mentioned in this episode will be in our show notes. This podcast may contain coarse language and mature subject matter. Listener discretion is advised. This is an independently produced podcast. If you could rate, review, and subscribe, that would really help us out, and we will be forever grateful. Okay, so first things first, did you know that molasses is called treacle in the UK? No, I've never heard that word before. You've never heard? Okay, so (laughs) I've heard treacle so many times, probably because I love the Great British Bake Off or baking show, whatever it is. But I never knew that it was molasses. I just assumed it was like custard or or something more British-y. But it's molasses. So treacle is molasses. Fun fact. Wow. <laughs> You're like, I still don't know the word, so it's not that cool. But I've always heard like they'll talk about treacle tarts, which I think is essentially like a big old butter tart. And it's a British thing. And I had no idea it was molasses. So I learned at least one new thing for this when I was doing this research. It's interesting. I actually, like, don't really love the taste of molasses. Well, like, by itself, it's just so unique and distinctive. And, like, if you use molasses, it tastes like molasses. Yeah, it's kind of like a burnt, sugary syrup. Yeah. Yeah. So if you don't know what molasses is, it's this really kind of thick, dark liquid that's extracted from sugarcane and sometimes from sorghum, but most commonly from sugarcane. And then it's boiled down to a syrup. And like Becca said, if you've never had it before, it has it has a sweet flavor and it's very rich, but it almost has like a smoky flavor. And I've personally only ever had it in one thing, which is ginger cookies. And then for the rest of the year, beyond the holiday season, I have a carton of molasses. I literally have one right now gathering dust in my cupboard. But that's okay because much like honey and maple syrup, the high sugar content and the lower water activity make molasses fairly shelf stable. So believe it or not, despite the distinct flavor, molasses used to be a sweetener of choice in North America. 
Up until about the 1880s, molasses was one of the most popular sweeteners because it was cheaper than refined sugar. In the early 1900s, the price of refined sugar plummeted, and most North American consumers made the full switch from molasses to refined sugar, which you can learn all about in our fifth episode of Dietetics After Dark, where we cover the history of sugar and the Harvard Sugar Study. Anyways, when molasses was having its heyday, some of the more popular uses were baked beans. That makes sense to me. Uh Just a little bit. So wait, Mm -hmm. is there molasses in all baked beans? Like if you bought a can at the store? Fact check. So molasses is not always used in baked beans. Often brown sugar or maple syrup will be used instead. Bean soups. Corn chowder, which like... I don't, the flavor profiles don't match up in my mind, but. I love how you just have a question mark <laughs> like, uh. beside that. <laughs> Meat marinades and barbecue sauces. I can get behind that. I can see how that works. Cookies, of course. Puddings, fruitcakes, shoe fly pie. Do you know what that is? No, but I like it. <laughs> so I love that name. I know, isn't it cute? So it's basically a molasses pie that got its name because it would, as it cooled, it would be super sweet and smell delicious and flies would come around it. So you'd have to shoo the flies. It's also used for bread. It was used as syrup on pancakes and waffles, which in my opinion is a major downgrade from actual maple <laughs> syrup, which is amazing. And it would even be used to sweeten coffee. And possibly the most important use with regards to today's story, molasses was used to make alcohol, mostly rum. But it was also used to make beer because it was cheaper and easier to make than traditional beer and also lower in alcohol. So like during the early colonialist times, it was actually an important alternative to water. I remember why I cut that out. I couldn't find a fact check. (laughs) So I read it in one article, but I'll throw that in there because I thought it was interesting. But who knows if it's true or not? (laughs) I love that. At least you've added a disclosure. (laughs) Yeah. Okay. so you might remember from episode five, that the process of extracting sugar from sugarcane juice produces a byproduct called molasses. So sugarcane is chopped and crushed to get the juice, and then it's boiled down so that the water evaporates off, and you get a syrup called wet sugar. Then this syrup is clarified, crystallized, and separated from a thick black liquid that is about 40 to 50% fermentable sugar, aka molasses. And then that molasses is fermented and distilled to make rum. So during fermentation, the sucrose in the molasses is converted to ethanol and carbon dioxide. And molasses is actually thought to be one of the earlier substrates used for fermentation by humans because it is so cost effective. And it also contains B vitamins that help speed up the ethanol production. So kind of Mm. cool. Now, you'll probably remember, Becca, that the history of sugar is anything but sweet. And our dear friend molasses is very similar. Christopher Columbus made a voyage to the Caribbean in 1493, and he made a pit stop in the Canary Islands to grab a stock of sugar cane to replant in Hispaniola, which is now Haiti and the Dominican Republic. And by the early 16th century, sugar cane plantations were well established throughout the hot and humid West Indies or the Caribbean. Molasses is, of course, a byproduct of sugar production, and it quickly became a key product for something in the triangular trade, which I had never heard of, but it's like, I think it's a really well-known trade cycle to historians, but it's this cyclical trade route that literally looks like a triangle on the map between Africa, the Caribbean, and the 13 colonies, which were the British colonies along the east coast of what would eventually become the United States. So sugarcane plantations in the Caribbean, which were owned by English, Spanish, and French colonies, would produce molasses and then ship it to the 13 colonies in the future U.S., where it was used for both household use and, of course, rum production. And then rum was sent to Africa, where it was traded for people being sold into slavery. And then the enslaved people were sent to the Caribbean, where they would work on the sugarcane plantations And so the cycle continued. So that formed the triangular trade, molasses, rum, and slaves. Pretty horrific. Mm, Yeah. And of course, it was very lucrative to those running the trade. (laughs) Uh, So by the 1700s, New England was one of the leading rum producers in the world. They had a great deal set up in which they traded their main exports, lumber, cheese, and flour for excess molasses from the French West Indies. 
But eventually, the molasses trade began to run into issues. First of all, supply was exceeding demand. Uh, So in England and France, there actually wasn't much of a market for molasses beyond rum. And in France, they actually prohibited the import of rum because it was competing with their brandy market. To deal with the excess, many of the sugar plantations began distilling their own rum in the Caribbean, and this was to deal with a large surplus of molasses. So around the same time, the French West Indies began ramping up molasses production and selling it at a cheaper price to the 13 colonies. The British could not compete with the low prices, and they were, of course, not happy about that. And up until this point, trade had been mostly unrestricted. So the Parliament of Great Britain saw an opportunity and they imposed the Molasses Act of 1733. The molasses. I did not come across <laughs> this in my research. It's interesting. It is interesting. And I also just love the name. So the Molasses Act imposed a tax of six pence per gallon on any non English molasses that was being brought into the 13 British colonies. So they were basically saying you can't buy anyone else's molasses. And the purpose of this was to stop colonies from buying any molasses that wasn't English. And of course, the colonies were angry, the other prices were better, so they protested the act and eventually just set up an effective underground molasses trade where they ignored the taxes and smuggled molasses in from the West Indies. And that that whole situation gives me serious great Canadian maple syrup heist vibes. Yeah, smuggling syrup of some kind. It's very Canadian. Very Canadian. <laughs> Uh, So the rum industry in New England continued to thrive, particularly in Massachusetts and Rhode Mm -hmm. Island. And by the mid-1700s, Massachusetts was the epicenter of rum production with over 63 distilleries. And I think uh, that's where you're going to pick up the story, right? It's a couple decades, actually centuries later, but it definitely relates to what you're talking about. Okay, cool. I just want to touch on really quick the nutrition of molasses, because there are a lot of reports of molasses actually being a superfood. Oh. Yes. (laughs) Episode eight, we talked about superfoods and how when you hear the word superfood, it's likely not a miracle, but it's probably a nutritious food. So there are two important caveats here. A, it's not a miracle product. So superfoods are usually just regular nutrient-dense foods. But B, it's not traditional molasses that has all these health benefits it's blackstrap molasses. So blackstrap molasses is traditional molasses that has been boiled down even further. So it has a much lower sugar content and a really, well, a fairly high concentration of minerals such as iron, calcium, magnesium, B6, selenium, and potassium. But the catch is that it's a bitter, salty sludge that you can't bake with. It'll ruin whatever you're baking. So people would take it by the spoonful. And it sounds disgusting. Like I was Googling, you know, everything about it and everything was like, yeah, it can give you some minerals if you can choke it down. So yeah, so while it can be a good source of some vitamins and minerals, it is certainly not everyone's cup of tea. And there are plenty of other healthful ways to get those nutrients. And with that, I am going to pass it to you and enjoy the rest of my coffee. (laughs) Thank you. Welcome. Um, Okay, so... This blackstrap molasses Mm -hmm. sounds a little bit like Vegemite to me. Oh, that is interesting. Let me quickly Google it. Like, what is Vegemite? I don't even know. I know what it is. I've tried it. But I don't know what it is. But it is salty, and it kind of has a weird, like, bittery texture to it. Is it the same? I think so. One second. No, it's brewer's yeast. Have you tried Vegemite before? No, I haven't. Do you like it? I know that I know that a lot of Australians really like it. I did not. It sounds very similar to what you were describing when you were talking about the molasses. I actually blackstrap. think it might be similar. Okay, so if you want to incorporate some blackstrap molasses, maybe you could enjoy it, much like the Australians enjoy Vegemite. <laughs> yeah, so I think it's similar. Good job. <laughs> Thank you. I know my foods. <laughs> okay. Thank you, Sarah. You've set me up pretty perfectly, actually. And before we do get into this story, it is pretty important to know a little bit about the history and the properties of molasses. And you did an excellent job walking us through that. And just before we get started, the sources that I use for my section include an article by Chuck Lyons in History Today and another article by Ferris Jabra in Scientific American. 
So I'm going to start us off a few decades from where you left us, but in a time where the rum and the overall alcohol industry were thriving. I'm talking about the pre-prohibition era. So it's the early 1900s in the United States and the temperance movement has begun. So temperance by definition is the moderation or abstinence of something. So it's often used to describe this period of time when there was an upheaval of individuals against the sale of liquor. Women played a huge role in this as alcohol was often associated with domestic abuse and infidelity. And many business owners also supported the concept of prohibition, if only to prevent workplace accidents and increase the efficiency of their employees. So this is a time when industrial production had picked up and factory workers were putting in many extended hours. And it honestly sounds like everyone was just really intoxicated all the time during this period of time. I know. So when I was doing my research too, it was like there were a bunch of different stats about how much rum everyone used to drink, like including mm-hmm. children. So it seems children like there too? was no age restriction. Yeah. And I think like to get children to sleep, it would be pretty common to just slip a couple shots of rum in their milk or something like that. So it's pretty yeah, normal. like put it on their bottle. <laughs> yeah. It is kind of sad that... One of the main reasons for prohibition was, well, two twofold, to st- reduce domestic abuse, but also to increase production. Like, I don't know, just sounds like not a great, great time for quality of life. No, definitely not. Kids were drunk. People were working a lot. <laughs> not a good era. No. <laughs> so there had actually already been an attempt to ban the trade of alcoholic beverages in the 1800s, and certain states and communities implemented laws against liquor on their own. So Massachusetts, which is where this episode takes place, they passed a law in 1838 prohibiting the sale of alcohol in amounts under 15 gallons. Hmm. So to put things in perspective, 15 gallons is 1,920 ounces, which is the equivalent of 74 26ers of alcohol. Okay. Do you follow? Yeah, but they passed a law. Right, right, right. Okay, I'll, yeah, I'll, yeah, I'll get into so it. So I was reading this as like, <laughs> Everybody who wanted alcohol had to buy it in massive quantities. No, no. So they were trying to deter people right. from buying alcohol by selling it in these mass quantities so that people couldn't afford it. Totally. Or it like goes bad and gross by the time. Like that's a huge quantity. Yeah. 74 26ers? Yeah, that's bulk for sure. It's a lot. It's a lot. And I was thinking about it. I was like, it's probably the amount that I consumed over my, oh my university gosh. career. <laughs> yeah. But, uh, <laughs> yeah. Let's not talk about it. all right moving on okay so just to put things in perspective and this was actually what you were just talking about today americans drink an average of about two gallons of alcohol Mm. per year and around this time americans drank an average of seven gallons of alcohol a year so it was a lot more do you know if this is like liquor so i think that this is like pure liquor that's a lot wow okay That's huge, actually. Oh, my goodness. It's a lot. So as I said, they implemented this 15-gallon rule to, like, financially discourage its individual sale. So you couldn't buy an individual drink anywhere. So you couldn't go to a bar. You couldn't get, like, a single bottle at a store. But this law, it it would allow doctors and pharmacists to use smaller quantities for medical purposes because that was used quite frequently. Mm. And for baby teething as well. They used to put it on, like, their, like, soothers. Yeah, rubbing on the gums. (laughs) Aww. <laughs> Aww. Yeah. So this tactic, the 15-gallon rule, was unsuccessful, very unsuccessful, as local friends would all pitch in and divide the 15 gallons amongst themselves. Other times, store owners or sellers would strategically sell 16 gallons of alcohol to customers, and then the customer would sell 15 gallons back to the store owner. Wow. So at least there was 15 gallons going either way, so it was legal. Hmm. Another method of legally obtaining alcohol was if it was given to you at no cost. So like a gift, essentially, since this law specified the sale of alcohol, not the consumption of it. So individuals would host gatherings where they would charge people for very low cost entertainment to like go and see a pig that had stripes on it. (laughs) And while they were there, they would often be given free drinks. And I say this in quotation marks because they were actually paying for the cost of the drinks and their entry fee to go and like look at this pig. Interesting. That's giving me almost gifting table vibes, but (laughs) (laughs) for alcohol instead of money. 
It's very sneaky. But people will do what they need to do to get their drink on. Yeah, I mean, I'd go to see the pig. (laughs) (laughs) Yeah. So this law was repealed in 1840. So this was two years after it was set due to all of these workarounds that sellers and buyers had created. And it wasn't until 1919 that Massachusetts and the rest of America were at risk of losing their precious alcohol again. Mm -hmm. So the development of the 18th Amendment to the U.S. Constitution was in the talks, but had yet to be approved. So this amendment legally banned the production, transportation, and sale of alcohol across the country. The U.S. had declared war on Germany two years prior to this, and as they entered World War I, President Woodrow Wilson wanted to ensure that grain was saved for food production rather than alcohol like vodka and whiskey. So the 18th Amendment was being discussed, and this new legislation put many alcohol producers and drinkers into, like, a panic. Wow. And this was not just the wheat-based alcohol, but other types of alcohol as well. So you have your rum, which, as we know, is sometimes made from molasses. Mainly made from molasses. Is it always made from molasses? Mainly. It can also be made from many, like, different sugar derivatives. And when you make rum, you also use sugar with molasses. So there's both, but molasses is traditionally part of it. It's interesting to think about, like, the context of when all this was happening in the States, like, just... Post World War One, the flu was taking mm-hmm. off. Like a pretty crazy time. I guess it makes sense that they'd want to save the grain for food production. <laughs> That's definitely the priority. But yeah, interesting. there were a lot, of, like a lot of reasons that kind of fed into prohibition. Like I said before, like there were women protesting against right. the whole temperance movement combined mm-hmm. with the need to ration supplies. It's yeah, interesting. and apparently it got like like pretty violent and stuff too, like these protests. And because there's people, mainly males who wanted to drink heavily and then their employers and their wives were like, please stop. Totally. But also it is addictive and like people were probably panicked. Yeah. And maybe even experiencing withdrawal. I'm not sure like if they still had access, but yeah. Definitely. I mean, there's a reason liquor stores have remained open during this pandemic. I was just thinking about that. Yeah. All right, so now we're at the Purity Distilling Co. in North Boston, which is located on Commercial Street. And I keep pronouncing it commercial. I don't know why, (laughs) but it's commercial. If I say it by accident, it's because I've been saying it like that in my head. (laughs) Just put a little flair on it. Commercial. So (laughs) this was an area that was mainly populated with Irish and Italian immigrants at this time. In addition to many modest homes, this area was also home to many small businesses. So Purity Distilling hosted a massive 2.3 million gallon molasses storage tank within its facility. And this thing was huge. So it was 50 feet high, which is about the height of a five-story building, and 90 feet in diameter. So it was really, really big. And it was built three years prior to 1919 and had cost about $30,000 or so to construct. It was located a short distance from the harbor, so it was about 200 feet away, making it perfectly situated to receive shipments of molasses that came by boat, mainly from uh, Cuba and Puerto Rico. And it was also close enough to the train station, so it was easy to move the molasses and the final ethanol product around. I should mention here that some sources claim that Purity Distilling distilled rum for molasses specifically, while others claim that uh, the molasses was used for drinking and chemical ethanol purposes. Mm. And then I also read some sources saying that it was a chemical plant, but that that there was like big panic pre-prohibition era, Mm -hmm. and they may have started producing ethanol for rum purposes. Interesting. Okay. So it's a little bit hazy. I think it's probably the last one I mentioned a little bit more because it does talk quite a bit about it being used for chemical stuff, but then also rum. So it's possible that that molasses was there illegally to be used for rum. But again, you have to think about where we are right now in history and people are panicking Mm -hmm. because alcohol is about to be taken away. Yeah. Okay. Mm -hmm. So everyone's producing the most that they can really do. Right. So regardless, the tank was created for mass amounts of this sticky substance, but unfortunately it had not been properly tested following its construction, and that's the tank. 
So typically a tank of this size or anything that will carry a significant amount of liquid would be tested by filling it with water to assess for leaks and repair any damage. But a shipment of molasses arrived a few days after the tank's completion, so they didn't have time to test it. And this tank had issues like right from the get-go. There were tiny little leaks that allowed for molasses to drip down the sides of the tank. So neighbors of the distillery would bring like cans to go and (sighs) fill with molasses to bring home. And kids would even go and and scrape the the remnants off the tank to make candy. (laughs) The leakage was so bad that the company actually painted the tank from blue to like a brown red color just to cover up the leaky appearance. Okay, that's some peanut (laughs) corporation of America. (laughs) Yeah. (laughs) Cover up job stuff. It's not good. It's not good, that's for sure. And people who lived like nearby as well, or worked at the facility, they also reported noises that would come from the tank. And apparently it sounded somewhat like a like a rumbling noise. Okay, so this is Red Flag City. Yes. Yes, it is. There's a lot here, a lot of red flags. And the shocking thing is, is it sounds like a lot of people knew about it. Mm-hmm. But they're like, eh, free candy, free molasses. Mm-hmm. <laughs> Bring in their Can't cups. complain. <laughs> also, you just kind of trust. Totally. You trust... Yeah. These types of corporations and things like that, that they're doing the right thing. Because mm-hmm. it puts every, it puts our business at risk, too. Yeah, absolutely. So after the fact, it was revealed that this contraption was made out of steel that lacked manganese. So this is like the chemical element or mineral. And this made it much more brittle in colder temperatures. It's rivets, so the, the bolts, they were also poorly placed, which is often where the molasses would leak from. Hmm. It had been filled a total of 29 times and only four times at its full capacity. So the last time it was ever filled was two days before the flood on January 13th, 1919. And a shipment of molasses had arrived from Puerto Rico and it put it at its full capacity. So it held about 2.3 million gallons of molasses, which is about three Olympic-sized swimming pools worth. Oh my gosh. That is so much. Okay. Mm-hmm. And it's January. Like, I'm seeing everything add up here. It's cold. The metal's brittle. Or the steel is brittle. Oh, my goodness. Okay. Yeah. <laughs> okay. So it was also January, which we talked about right at the top of the episode, which is colder in Boston. But on January 15th, it was only about 40 degrees Fahrenheit, so 4 degrees Celsius. Okay. And some say it was the mixing of the warm molasses from Puerto Rico with the cold molasses that remained in the tank that was also beginning to warm up with the mild weather. Others say it was because the tank was poorly constructed. And then some people also believe that the older molasses that was in the tank had started to ferment. So like you were talking about, Sarah, and it starts producing carbon dioxide that created an explosion due to the pressure. Oh my goodness. But it's likely a combination of all of these things because they all sound reasonable. Pretty legit. <laughs> yeah. Pretty reasonable. So at about 1230 in the afternoon, this tank exploded, releasing 26 million pounds of molasses in a 40-foot wave at 35 miles an hour. So that's 56 kilometers for oh, us Canadians. Oh my gosh. And it destroyed almost everything it touched in those first few moments. Nearby buildings were literally reduced to kindling from the shards of the tank and from the speed at which they were hit with the molasses. A large piece of the tank landed on the railroad tracks and forced a train into two people. So Pascal in Atosca and Maria Di Stasio who were both only 10 years old and were fetching firewood um, with each other and Maria's brother. So a three-foot firehouse was literally taken from its foundations, trapping three firefighters underneath it. Many homes were also removed from their foundations and swept away, either into the harbor or just like displaced completely. People, horses, and other animals drowned if they were unable to get their heads above the wave. And for almost 100 meters, this molasses remained at least chest high. Wow. Mm -hmm. It's 100 meters. This is such a, like, I know, that's far. Mm -hmm. Chest high. And this, like, the visual of this molasses bursting, and it's all shiny and black and, like, so thick. It's pretty Mm -hmm. astounding. I would love to see a movie about this. 
I know. I'm actually surprised that there hasn't been one done. Yeah. I guess it's just, it's a pretty huge tragedy. Like, mm-hmm. there's not there's not much positive. Ah, uh, yeah. I'm, some things happen at the end. We'll get into it. Okay, so one article in the Smithsonian retells the story of Maria's brother, who I mentioned previously. She's that 10-year-old girl. So Anthony DiStasio, walking homeward with his sisters from the Michelangelo school, was picked up by the wave and carried, tumbled on its crest, almost as though he were surfing. Then he grounded and the molasses rolled him like a pebble as the wave diminished. He heard his mother call his name and couldn't answer. His throat was so clogged with the smothering goo. He passed out, then opened his eyes to find three of his four sisters staring at him. He was one of the lucky ones. So as he was essentially running away, this molasses, like I said before, it trapped his feet like flypaper, and then he was taken with the wave. Wow. So this stuff was really bad. Sticky and like Sticky. thick and heavy. I'm feeling like when you were just reading that quote, I was starting to feel like a little um, suffocatey. <laughs> What's the word? Claustrophobic. <laughs> oh, yeah. I can't imagine 21 people died. But there were a lot of people that did survive that mm. suffered from respiratory issues and things like that. So that's a whole other thing. Oh, my goodness. The thing about molasses is that it exhibits completely different properties than water. Mm hmm. It is not the same thing as water. And I actually wanted, like, earlier when you said, I know they didn't test the tank, but if they had tested it with water, that's not even close to the same thing. It wouldn't weigh the same. It wouldn't weigh the same, but they probably would have seen the leaks coming out of it. Yeah, that's true. Okay. Right? Because you'd have water mm-hmm. spraying out of probably yeah. every bolt. Yeah, true. Actually, it would probably be more obvious because molasses would be slower to leak, whereas water would mm-hmm. just be, like, squirting out. I think that's the thing, right? Like, it was slowly going out and people... In the neighborhood, we're just going and collecting it. Yeah. And it wasn't that significant of a loss for the company, clearly, because they just continued to fill it. And it was clearly very cheaply constructed. Yeah. And it probably also made the neighborhood, like the people in the surrounding area that are, you know, hearing the rumbling noises, they're like, meh, you know, at least we get that free molasses. It, it might have like calmed tensions. Yeah. And you might just think it's part of the process, right? The distilling process. Yeah. That rumbling noise. The thing about molasses is that it exhibits completely different properties in water. Molasses is considered a non-Newtonian fluid, meaning that its viscosity is completely dependent on the forces applied to it. And this really great article in Scientific American compared it to toothpaste. So when we tilt a tube of toothpaste around with the lid off, like nothing really happens. Like if you hold it upside down, maybe... A little bit will ooze out eventually, but it's pretty harmless. But if we take that capless tube and we squeeze it with a sudden force, you have a pretty big mess. Mm -hmm. And this is essentially what happened here. So molasses is almost impossible to swim in due to its viscosity and density. It can get up to 10,000 times more viscous than water, depending on how it's made. So if you were in a pool of it and you were trying to move it away, from your face, Mm -hmm. the moment you bring your arm back up to remove more, it brings that molasses you just moved away back up to your face. This is a nightmare. it's sticking. I know. This is a true nightmare. I'm going to dream about this tonight. Thanks, Becca. (laughs) I'm so sorry. (laughs) So some research has been done trying to reenact what this would have been like in this scenario. Only the researchers used corn syrup instead, which has pretty similar properties. I don't know why they wouldn't just just... use molasses. Maybe the mess. Maybe it dyes things or something. doesn't come out of clothing well. (laughs) They don't like the smell. Yeah. (laughs) (laughs) So the first wave of rescue came from 116 sailors who had just docked nearby. They were joined by the Boston police, Red Cross, and the Army. The rescue lasted multiple days as the cooled molasses created a gelatinous state that people would get stuck in. And it was challenging to identify individuals who were covered in the brown substance versus just like the wreckage. Mm. Other people were swept into the harbor and the Massachusetts Bay. But on mainland, molasses was everywhere. It was on all crevices of every building. It was on the people that were affected by this and the people who were helping. And I can't even imagine what it would be like to get this stuff out of your hair. Oh, no. Yeah, no, that would take forever. Mm -hmm. 
You'd have molasses under your fingernails too for years probably. Yeah, probably. <laughs> and if, if that's how long it would take you just to get it off of your body, I can't imagine every single building, every inch of it just covered in molasses. Okay. Also, you just reminded me when I was doing my research, some people put molasses in their hair as a conditioner. Oh. So pr- maybe <laughs> after the molasses or the molasses flood, people had great hair. Their locks were luscious. So why the roaring 20s were so roaring. Everyone exactly. would just go out, showcase their <laughs> Everyone hair. Had shiny hair. <laughs> so it's estimated that this cleanup took about 87,000 man hours, which took about six months. They had to use fire hoses to power wash almost all surfaces and use like chisels and saws to break up the molasses when it started to harden. The entire city also smelled the molasses. So I assume mm. you would be thinking about this tragedy at all times. Wow. Overall, it's said to have cost about $100 million in today's money just to like tidy and repair all the damage. And the incident ultimately, as I said, it killed 21 people and injured 150 people. The day following the tragedy, Congress approved the 18th Amendment that I was talking about earlier. Whether this was a coincidence or not is unclear, but it is possible that the Malasker may have had something to do with the beginning of prohibition. Mm. So the amendment didn't officially go into effect until January 17th, 1920, though. So this was a year later. They just approved it the day after. Um, And then prohibition it lasted until 1933. So it was oh a long 13 goodness. years, I'm sure. Okay. I don't know very much about prohibition at all, but I find it really interesting. I wonder if we could Same. do that one day for an episode. Definitely. We could just use my intro. <laughs> yeah, for sure. <laughs> cool. Uh, okay. Yeah. Tensions were high. It's a fascinating time. Obviously, there's a lot of But like, it's also the roaring 20s. Hardship. The roaring 20s. And prohibition. Like, how do those line up? Well, the roaring 20s. It's because everyone was going into uh, like underground bars and drinking illegally, making moonshine and getting real tipsy. Yeah, that sounds like there's some good stories there. (laughs) Definitely. So back to 1919, there was some suspicion that foul play had caused the tank to explode. One month following the disaster, though, the results of the investigation were made public by Chief Judge of Boston Municipal Court, Wilfred Bolster. He ultimately blamed the tank, stating that it was structurally insignificant to handle the load of molasses. He also charged the parent company of Purity Distilling, which is called the United States Industrial Alcohol, or USIA. He charged them with manslaughter for their clear neglect in this tragedy. The grand jury in the case found that the tank was both built and inspected insufficiently, but they did not agree with the manslaughter charge. USIA maintained that their tank had been sabotaged, likely by Italian anarchists. They claimed that they had received a phone call threatening the tank one year prior to the incident. And they also stated that threatening posters had been plastered up in the neighborhood just days beforehand. And this alternative story, it wasn't completely impossible as a bomb had been found in another USIA location three years beforehand. And this all likely has something to do with the temperance movement. So people against the consumption of alcohol. Hmm. So regardless of these claims, by August 1920, the USIA had 119 individual lawsuits filed against them from those who were either injured or from the family members of the victims. So they blamed the tank exclusively and demonstrated evidence that the materials used to build it were thinner than what was documented. And they actually use shards of the tank that they found to prove this. Oh, awesome. Apparently, the man who had constructed the vessel named Arthur Gell, he was a financial officer. Oh, my gosh. Not an engineer of any kind. So the tank was likely constructed with money in mind rather than safety. (sighs) Gell couldn't even read the plans for the tank, nor had he sought out any advice from an engineer that was on record. The plaintiffs were also able to show that the tank construction was rushed and it had not been tested, as I said previously. What the heck? Why would a financial officer even want to make a tank? (laughs) Probably for money. I guess, but it's just so stupid. It doesn't really make sense to me, but these were also different times where things like inspections weren't 
commonplace. Yeah. Well, yeah. I hope this set some precedent. Okay, it definitely did. <laughs> so three years and 921 witnesses later, the existing transcript for this case is almost 25,000 pages. Oh, you read it, right? And it took... Uh, yeah, I read the whole thing. We have to be evidence-based. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> I'm impressed. <laughs> um, so it took this hired attorney and auditor. His name is Hugh Ogden. It took him a year to review all of the notes. And to this day, this case actually remains the longest and most costly civil suit in the history of the state of Massachusetts. So on April 28th, 1925, just over six years after the massacre, Ogden finally concluded that the company was liable. USIA and the distillery had been unable to provide any evidence that the tank had been attacked like they had claimed. USIA was required to pay $300,000 in damages, which is about $4.5 million in today's money, which is not enough. No. <laughs> Considering the amount of damage. Didn't it cost $100 million to... Yeah. 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 And no, only no. 6000 went to the families of the victims. Wow. Although USIA agreed to a separate settlement to provide them with more money, but this amount remains undisclosed. Hmm. Then $25,000 went to the city and $42,000 went to the railroad company. Oh, interesting. Wow, the railroad company got quite a bit. <laughs> yeah, it, like the shards mm -hmm. destroyed some of the tracks. I think it may have destroyed some of the trains as well. Uh, I'm not really sure why it would have received more money than the city, but maybe they had a good lawyer. Yeah, true. <laughs> so this incident, as you talked about like two seconds ago, it did set a precedent for all construction projects moving forward. So the city of Boston started requiring that any plans be approved by an architect or engineer before putting them in action, which seems like such common sense. But this practice then became the standard across America. So it wasn't really before. That's wild, but I'm happy that some that this was became standard practice. <laughs> no kidding, right? And I do wonder, like I wonder even if in, in Canada, if that set a precedent for us as well. Yeah. Everyone probably wanted to avoid a molasker after this. Definitely. So no one ever rebuilt the tank and the space was cleared out and converted into what is now a public park. So there's a small plaque that explains the tragedy that took place on that day over 102 years ago. And it is often said that if you are in Boston on a hot day, you can still smell the remnants of molasses. No way. Mm -hmm. Oh, I want to go try. <laughs> go try smell. <laughs> yeah, go to Boston on a really hot day and just start sniffing. <laughs> but I actually forgot to tell you to scroll down to the bottom of the document. Ooh, okay. Just to see wow. the disaster. Okay, was the tank in this picture and it's just totally gone? So I don't actually know where the tank would be in relation to this photo. I actually think that this might have been like a little bit further away from where it exploded. Yeah. Because not all of the buildings are like torn to shreds. Totally. And you can see like you can see all along the ground where it's muddy. It looks muddy, but it's probably molasses. Mm -hmm. And there's oh. still a flood off in the distance. Yeah. So we'll post this on Instagram. It's it really shows you how bad this was. Okay, I love that story. I love the historical stories, first of all, but this story in particular is just such a visual, like the flood, the big initial wave of molasses. And like, I can, when you were describing it, I could physically feel like suffocated by molasses. So good job. Means I did my job right. Yeah, you did a very good job. So that's, that's the story. I loved it. Yeah, I found it really fascinating to research. That story was awesome. I would put it up there in my favorites. I mean oh, it. Good. Right up there with the great maple syrup heist. I just love yeah, these. Yeah, that like, one was one of my <laughs> The sticky substances just do something for me. <laughs> it is funny how we kind of, we really enjoy retelling and hearing the less nutrition-based stories. Yeah. But the more like food industry-based stories. Because I think we get a lot of the nutrition in our everyday life. So this is kind of more entertainment. Absolutely. And it also, yeah, it just shows, I think when I was in my education, I always thought food industry was kind of boring. <laughs> How dare you? Yeah. <laughs> but when you hear these stories, like even the Peanut Corporation of America one, it is so important to have safe mm -hmm. food industry practices. Or you get things like the Boston Massacre. Yep. Yeah. 
So anyways, fascinating as always. Very well told. Good job. Thank you. And I have a question for you. (laughs) All right. Hit me. So, you know, little Debbie treats like the little desserts and hostess. Yes. Do you have a favorite? Okay. This is actually kind of weird to admit. I have never tried little Debbie. What? Treats. Never tried them. I tried my first Twinkie, I think, when I was 25 years old. Wow. You've never... Okay, Little Debbies were, like, really popular in Canada. Yeah. So, um, I mean, my mom's a dietitian. Yeah. (laughs) And she never bought them for us. And I don't remember really ever asking for them. I know that my friends and stuff had them, but I remember wagon wheels. Yeah. I hated wagon wheels. Are those just, like, Joe Louis? They have, like, marshmallow in them. Yeah. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Similar. And I don't, like, this is strange, but I like marshmallows when they're heated. Okay. Like in a Rice Krispie square or a schmore. (laughs) Schmore. Schmore. (laughs) Schmore. (laughs) Okay, guys. It's really early. Yeah. (laughs) (laughs) But I don't like unheated marshmallows. Okay. So, like, marshmallow fluff. Yeah. Or just, like, a raw marshmallow? Just raw marshmallow. Not my thing. I love raw marshmallows. Hmm. Okay. So I had wagon wheels, wasn't a huge fan of them, so then I never really tried Little Debbie's. Okay. That's, I guess, fair. A little alarming. You like cosmic brownies. Your friends must have had those when you were a kid. They're just um, the brownie squares and they had almost like they looked like nerds, but they were just like yes. sprinkles. Those were so good and so dense and amazing. I've definitely tried one of those. Okay. Yeah. Those are good. Those are Little Debbie, I think. Oh, are they? Okay. Yeah. Then I, wait, are they? Doesn't Little Debbie have a variety of things? Yeah. Variety of flavors? But I think the Cosmic Brownies are... Let me just check. This is easy to fact check real time. Okay, yeah. Because I like envision the Little Debbie's things to be... Okay. So I'm I'm a liar. Okay, perfect. (laughs) I'm glad we established that real time. (laughs) (laughs) You caught me. (laughs) But yeah, no, I have tried those brownies. I just Mm -hmm. haven't tried like the more like white cake. Yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah. Like the Twinkie. Like the Twinkies. Which is actually Hostess. Okay. Not Little Debbie. Yeah. So Twinkies, I actually, like, I didn't hate it. Yeah. But by the time I was 25, I had tried, like, good cupcakes and cake. For sure. Before. And I feel like it was just, like, this is just more of a convenient snack. Yeah. Absolutely. I honestly don't even know. I've probably tried a Twinkie, but I can't remember the specific time. And that is your teaser for the next episode. Ooh. (laughs) So we'll leave you with the Twinkie. Well, thanks for joining us, everyone. Yeah, thanks for joining us. We love you all so much. Thank you for your constant support. Bye. Bye. See you next week. Thanks for listening to this episode of Dietetics After Dark. You can find all the references and materials used to put this podcast together in our show notes at dieteticsafterdark.com. This is an independently produced podcast. If you enjoyed this episode, we would love it if you would rate, review, and subscribe to our show. For more information, follow us on Instagram at Dietetics After Dark. If you have an idea for an episode or segment, email us at dieteticsafterdark at gmail.com. This podcast was recorded and edited by Earworm Radio. We highly recommend their services for all of your podcasting needs. You can learn more about them at earwormradio.com.